Medical Service uh, at the Department of Public Information uh, within the UN Secretariat. Uh, we are here with colleagues from on the Information Center Service uh, who are making this WebEx uh, possible uh, with you. Uh, so hopefully everything will go well. Uh, uh, please regard this as, uh, as a kind of experiment, as a kind of uh, uh, test on our part. Uh, be patient with us, try to enjoy as much of it as, as possible. We are certainly doing that. We're very enthusiastic about making this, uh, this happen. As you probably may remember, this uh, idea grew out of a series of uh, WebEx sessions that we had and with several of you leading up to the uh, summit today uh, with colleagues uh, from EPI, also from the Secretary General's climate change team, giving you an idea of what it is, the program, what is to be expected. Uh, that was at the beginning of September. Uh, in, in the span of uh, about one or, two, uh, one or two weeks. It was during those WebEx sessions that several of you expressed the interest that it would be so nice uh, to be connected, uh, to be somehow part of uh, the, uh, the experience of the summit. So we thought we'll, we'll give it a try. Uh, we will be live with you uh, as of now, meaning from, from 11 New York time to about 2 o'clock uh, New York time. Uh, we are building our program around uh, the Secretary General's press briefing, which will be from 11.30 to 12.15. We will be watching that together. Uh, at the same time, we will also make sure that we will have some experts with us who will give you some idea of what is going on, also uh, experts with whom you might uh, discuss certain issues. Uh, in the first uh, part, before the Secretary General's press conference, what we will have uh, is, uh, is uh, uh, or are actually experts from the World Meteorological uh, Organization. Uh, I will call them in very shortly, but before I do that, uh, let me just give you a very quick uh, uh, overview of actually where we are. The summit did in fact kick off uh, with an opening ceremony, roughly half an hour, a uh, little after 8 o'clock. It was uh, one of those cases where things were almost on time. Uh, the speakers themselves were sticking to uh, the, uh, the, the very minimal amount of time given to them, so only a couple of minutes. The Secretary General started off uh, the, the event. It was very much to the point. Uh, I think uh, one of the major quotes that I would take from his speech, speech I think is available to all of you, it was sent out, is that he said it very clearly that we're not here to talk, we're here to make history. And I think that's what we're looking at. Uh, we had a couple of very, very emotional uh, uh, and also very, very sort of entertaining uh, interventions, uh, uh, including also uh, from the mayor of New York. We also have uh, we also had Dr. Rajendra Pachuri, the, the chair of the uh, IPC, who gave an overview of the fifth assessment report of the ICC. Uh, we had Mr. Alvord. We had uh, Ms. Lee Bing Bing, the uh, the actress and the human. Uh, Google Ambassador. She also played a short video uh, 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 that was put together by, by uh, 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 seven young people uh, who basically covered the topic of why, why not as far as climate change uh, was concerned. We have that video uh, later on. We have Mr. Leonardo DiCaprio, which is recently uh, uh, appointed by the Secretary General as the messenger of peace specifically focusing on climate issues. Uh, I think it was very, very uh, to the point. Uh, and in the end, we had a civil society representative chosen out of 500,000 people from the Marshall Islands, this is Kathy Jekyll Kitchener, and, and uh, her intervention, her poem, uh, and, uh, and, and her guest was, uh, was I think, especially moving. So this is where, 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 where it all started. We have that opening ceremony. Right now what you have are national action and ambition announcements from the participating member states. Uh, as you know, uh, over 120, I think 125 of them, uh, in various different settings. There's the ECOSOC chamber, the trusteeship chamber, uh, and the general assembly hall where these national announcements are being done. The idea is to be visionary, to be bold, and to be uh, to the point. And each and every one of them, each and every one of those taking part, are given roughly about four minutes uh, to, to make those, those very concrete and bold announcements that are expected of them. Uh, these announcements will also continue in the early afternoon. At the same time, if you wish, there's going to be kind of like a halftime, which is what the Secretary General's press conference is about. 
is going to give an idea of roughly where we are uh, in, in the middle of the day. And at the end of the day, of course, around uh, 7, 8 o'clock, when the closing ceremony is, he will give an overview of, of, of those announcements. Announcements. There will also be a private sector lunch, which will involve the private sector, government representatives, industry people, investors. It will be a, a great forum for all of these actors to come together. And also in the afternoon, uh, as you probably know, uh, there will be several so called multilateral and multi stakeholder action announcements, building on eight specific themes finance, energy, forest, agriculture, resilience, petroleum and industry also transport and cities. Why those? Because those were considered to be the key areas where you can actually make tangible progress, where you can actually come up with, with, with meaningful sort of uh, uh, proposals, especially as regards uh, reaching the goal of, of, uh, of uh, keeping the temperature uh, rise uh, below uh, the two uh, degrees uh, Celsius, which is the main aim. Of, of discussion. And there will also be thematic discussions involving uh, civil society representatives on climate science, on climate health and jobs, on economic case for action, and on voices from the climate front line. So that's the overview. A lot of the things are available for you on the UN website. Uh, paper smart approach as far as the speeches are concerned. Uh, also, UN Radio has the number of interviews and programs in various different languages. All the six official languages of the UN, plus Kiswale, Haley, plus Portuguese. Uh, and also social media, which we will be monitoring. So, that's my very brief and quick uh, and dirty introduction, if you wish. And I want to call in the guests that we have from WMO. Okay, so let them come in. We have, from the World Meteorological Organization, we have Mr. Michael Williams. Michael is the Chief Communication and Public Affairs Officer. Michael is coming in. Uh, also, we have uh, one of the radio, uh, one of the broadcast announcers. I will give my seat over here. Uh, and that is, if I get it right, yes, that's Paul Monare uh, from South Africa. And we also have a third guest. Key messages from the three big volumes, and that will be the, uh, the, the uh, 
strong degree on top of the cake uh, of the IPCC, the fifth assessment report. So we are here uh, with the IPCC team to um, provide the um, policy relevant but not policy prescriptive information that the IPCC has assembled over the last three years and uh, here and uh, ready to try to answer your questions. Yes, um, just quickly add the word of the moment and we're trying to just get the message across as people are familiar with our business and uh, the day of efficiency. And uh, you know, it's also quite helpful with the bring you to our world of forecast and the world of climate change education and our presentation. Also, it's good when it comes to bring awareness about the challenges we face. Well, we will now turn it over to uh Um, actually, to, 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 uh, actually, we still have no question yet. So, so. I just mentioned that you know Claudia Chelli from the Global Television, I believe. Uh, one of your web deputies is here with us and uh, has been uh, doing some yeah. reporting in here. Uh, she interviewed me uh, yesterday, so you will uh, probably uh, uh, see me later in, in when the program is broadcast. Okay. I, I repeat the question, but the question is, how, 
how, how do we know that um, it's humans that are responsible for climate change when we didn't create um, climate and climate is a natural process? It's a very good question. It's a, it's a question about which the IPCC, GIEC in French, uh, has spent a lot of time and uh, many pages in its reports uh, to balance and to assess the, the relative weight of natural factors, which of course are important to uh, uh, explain some of the uh, changes in climate. Uh, for example, t t volcanic eruptions have an influence on climate, they cool climate when they take place, the solar viability has some influence as well. Uh, but it has become clear that at least uh, for the last 50 years, uh, the um, uh, for the last 50 years, uh, the um, human factors, mostly the emissions of greenhouse gases, uh, have become the dominant uh, factor, uh, which is uh, which is a factor that is stronger than natural factors. How do we know that? Well, mostly by comparing uh, the result of climate simulations done with climate models, which are either influenced only by natural factors or that are influenced by natural factors and human factors. And when you compare the two kinds of simulations, you see that only the simulations that take on board all the factors are in line with what has happened over the last 50 years. So we are now quite convinced, I mean, the international scientific community and the IPCC are quite convinced, quite convinced that the dominant factor uh, are the emissions of CO2 and other greenhouse gases. And therefore, uh, it gives humans uh, the, uh, the leverage, the possibility to act because we can influence those uh, emissions. I hope I answered your question. Uh, I want to hear that it from uh, I said it before Mr. Dr. along has a question. Actually, he has gone to put that equivalent edges demands uh, what is made today. Uh, there, UN Secretary mentioned that we will be climate neutral by the year 2020. So, my immediate colleague who was asking that what are the major has been taken to be climate uh, neutral by 2020? I think that, that is an excellent question. Indeed, that the Secretary General made that point in his opening remark. Uh, honestly, I don't have the details, but I'm sure that he will be asked at the at the press conference. Or if not, we will be able to get that uh, get that answer to you from our from our colleagues. Because after the press conference, we will also have uh, other experts who will be with us. But you're absolutely right. That was one of the points that the Secretary General has has made in his opening remark. Uh, any other questions? To our Almati has a question. Uh, yes. Good morning. Uh, just a quick question because uh, Kazakhstan itself and Central Asia as, as a sub region are of course very much affected by climate change and actually journalists are very much interested uh, if uh, the recent initiatives actually that are being uh, kind of uh, offered uh, here by especially Kazakhstan as the big economy and of course the Astana Expo 2017 uh, that is actually dedicated to the future energies. Uh, will be somehow reflected, first the uh, question, and second, if uh, any of the future sessions of the development of the uh, adultic organizations perhaps could be planned to take place in Central Asia. Thank you. Kazakhstan meetological office 
very engaged in the whole global uh, network of other weather services um, and benefits enormously from you know, the sharing of observations and information from around the world and also on its side that contributes enormously to sharing information with other countries around it. Maybe just a word on IPCC because uh, the um, IPCC is uh, also a global organization and we try to, to, to spread our meetings and to have meetings in different regions of the world. We have not had uh, recently at least a meeting in Kazakhstan, but I know there is a, a talk, uh, some, some preparation to uh, consider having an IPCC meeting in the next uh, two or three years in Tajikistan, which is uh, not very far. Uh, That's correct. I mean, it still needs to be confirmed. Thank you very much. Thank you. That meeting, uh, I'm sorry. So that in our, in our preparatory press briefings, that this summit today is not part of the negotiations process. It's not negotiation time. But the question then is, uh, what is IPCC looking for? What are you, what, 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 what you know, what, uh, what would you expect? What, uh, what is it that makes this summit important from your perspective? Well, you know, the IPCC does not expect anything in terms of action. It's not its role. The role of IPCC is to provide the best quality, the best, uh, the most objective scientific information about all dimensions of climate change. You know, the diagnosis has been made, the climate is changing. It is mostly due to human activities. It will have severe impact if we don't uh, attack the problem, we don't deal with the problem. Uh, but because it's a human-caused problem, as I explained earlier, it also means we can, we can handle it. And there are solutions. Uh, there are solutions in the adaptation area, there are solutions in the mitigation area, mitigation uh, meaning uh, emission reductions. And there are also opportunities to uh, um, to make sure that those solutions also deliver benefits in other areas, better air quality, better health, job creation, fighting poverty, access to, to, to energy for those who don't have access to energy, etc. So the IPCC is extremely um, committed to providing and to bring, bringing all that information uh, uh, to the decision makers. So in, in such a summit where uh, 120 or whoever uh, heads of government, head of state meet, um, uh, dozens of ministers and, and hundreds of uh, delegates. It's extremely important for the IPCC to be here to uh, answer questions like I'm trying to do now and provide information uh, that's useful. But we don't have a view of what must be done because that's not our role. Uh, we, we, we need to, to, to stand back a little bit from, from that. Now, that being said, that being said, I can still say something that's a little bit in that direction, but I need to be cautious. Uh, if you look at the diagnosis, if you look at the trends, if you look at the emission trends, uh, which are going up now at the global scale, uh, and if you also um, if you also are aware of the international agreed uh, target, which is to bring to, to bring the emissions down so that uh, the temperature doesn't go above uh, two degree warming. Uh, above the pre-industrial value, well, uh, it's an objective fact that there is a mismatch between that uh, increasing uh, 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 emission trends and what would be needed uh, in terms of emission trends uh, to, to satisfy the internationally agreed two degree uh, objective. Uh, so any scientist has to, um, has to, has to observe that and that, uh, that gap is, is not addressed yet. And so this, this meeting um, intention is to, 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 I mean, one of the intentions is to bring the level of ambition uh, in, in all country in, 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 in coherence uh, with, with the uh, two degree target so that the gap between what is happening and what is needed is reduced. Sorry, Pastor, I just continue very quickly. Um, it has also been said that, that obviously what the Secretary General expects from the participants, from the 120 odd member state representatives at the highest level, is to come with bold, actual, concrete pledges, actions. Is it naive on my part to assume that IPCC will be kind of making at least a mental note of these these pledges, these actions, and when they go and, and maybe try to hold it into the negotiation process, 
through Lima and, 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 and up to, uh, of course, uh, Paris. Uh, I, I may have to disappoint you a little bit. Yeah, no. I, 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 I mean, yeah, this is it. certainly, I, I'm here and I'm taking notes uh, indeed in, in the plenary. Uh, but the IPCC works on the basis of uh, peer review literature mostly. And, and uh, it's a, you know, a scientific organization, and scientists work with scientific papers and official reports to a certain extent, but mostly scientific papers. Um, and it will take some time for what has been said here in New York today uh, to be um, assessed by scientists transforming numbers uh, and, and, and also in terms of uh, um, improvement um, in terms of reduced warming. So it will take some time, but certainly what is uh, announced here and possibly decided in Lima and Paris in the next few years will be reflected in the scientific literature that will be assessed in the next reports uh, during five, six, seven years that it needs to be decided uh, by the IPCC. So we will not immediately uh, transfer, uh, translate the information we are getting into um, numbers and um, scientific documents, but it will certainly be part of the future. The Secretary General's press conference is going to start very shortly, but, but uh, before that, maybe we can squeeze in just the, actually the same question to, to, to Michael. Why is WMO interested in What are you guys expecting from this uh, uh, event, this summit? Well, my answer, of course, will be very similar to Bill Pascal's. We, we bring the science here, and we are convinced by the science. So we do hope that uh, the world governments, the businesses, civil society, everyone who is here will uh, Act on the science, accept the science, and respond to it by taking a distraction to address climate change. Great. Well, thank you very much to all, all, all three of you. Thank you very much for being part of this. Good luck uh, to all three of you. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, we'll be switching over and waiting for the Secretary General's press conference. Uh, once again, uh, after the Secretary General's uh, press conference, and uh, we have a truly wonderful expert with us uh, uh, as a guest speaker, uh, Dr. Coco Warner. Uh, especially pleased to have her here with us for several reasons. One, uh, she has been part of the uh, climate change process for quite some time. She's a scientist, but she's also a person who knows things on the community level. Uh, so thank you very very much, Dr. Warner, for, for being with us. Uh, we chatted a little bit, and I know from Dr. Warner that, in fact, she has been to several of the places uh, that we have uh, uh, today were with us, several of the, uh, of the countries, several of the capitals, and she knows a little bit the lay of the, uh, of the land. Uh, but before we get into that and, and specifics, and, and before we pass the floor on to you also for, for uh, questions, let me just very quickly ask, uh, ask you, Dr. Warner, Based on what you what you heard, what impressed you the most? Thanks very much, Janos, and hello everyone out across the world. It's a pleasure to be with you. Here in New York City, it's, as you've experienced, we've just heard the Secretary General and leaders from countries and the business talk about their commitment to fight climate change. I think some of the things that impressed me most were, from a scientific perspective, um, we know increasingly where the sources of, of human-driven climate change come from. We know where the emissions are. We know where they're produced. We know more or less how it works. I think what's interesting here in New York City is you're seeing countries, business, cities, civil society, indigenous people, everyone, um, like the Secretary General said, all hands on deck, everybody's coming, and we're seeing those areas with the highest mitigation potential being laid on the table and companies coming together and saying these are areas where we have the potential today to reduce global greenhouse gas emissions and those are the drivers of climate, climate change. So I found that inspiring. Not enough, but inspiring. Okay, let me pick on that. Not, not enough. From a scientific perspective, I had a chance to be a lead author of this UN um, climate change report. It's IPCC fifth assessment report. And in that report, um, with 
No equivocation. Scientists across the world have stated that the decisions that we make today will have dire consequences for the coming centuries. What we're doing here today in New York City is incredibly important to set ambition, to reach out to you as journalists across the world to raise awareness and ambition. But if we do not ambitiously raise our sights even above what we're doing today, it won't be enough to avoid negative impacts from climate change. Um, just, just before we had the Secretary General's press uh, conference, we also had, of course, uh, uh, somebody here from, uh, from the IPCC pro uh, process. And it has been, again, time and again said as, as a lead up to this press, uh, to this, this event today, that this is not a negotiation process. This is not part of the, uh, the IPCC uh, or the UNFCC process. Yet, of course, uh, Everybody's watching what uh, what member states are saying, what industry is saying, what the investors are saying. Uh, as as you said, uh, in fact, all all hands uh, on on deck who who are here. So it's not just about who is here, but what they what they actually say. Now, the Assistant Secretary General Bob Orr, uh, in one of his lead up press conferences, mentioned that of course. It's not part of the negotiation process, but everybody will be hoping that somehow these announcements will be folded into the process. And it might be fall on the media, it might be fall on NGO uh, and civil society representatives, maybe even uh, the scientists, uh, uh, the academia, to kind of hold uh, a little bit uh, to, to the commitment, the various different uh, uh, sort of high-level people that have made these commitments, uh, co commitment here, whether it's the member state representatives or whether it's, uh, it's uh, big corporations or whether it's the investors. So from your perspective, uh, what would you say uh, are the chances of, of having these, these truly unique and, and, and bold commitments uh, 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 be somehow showing up in, in, the, in, in the negotiations? Or what would be needed for that? So. Um the policy world here in New York City, as well as in capitals where all of you are, are looking with anticipation towards 2015 in sustainable development in climate change, in reducing the impact of natural disasters, or, or let's say disasters, and in the humanitarian world. So 2015 is huge. And the link between what's going on today and this week in New York City and those policy processes seems to be the following. Initiatives are being laid on the table, and they're getting media coverage that's so essential. Um, the next step in terms of policy is in a couple of weeks in the city that I live in, which is Bonn, Germany, many of these same um, government representatives will come together to work out the architecture for the climate, for what we're hoping will be a 2015 agreement on climate change. It's not one-to-one, -one, but if you look at the kinds of initiatives that you just heard about, forests, transport, particularly in cities, energy systems like, like what you're hearing about in Africa, those are exactly the areas that need to be part of this, this architecture of the agreement. So what we're hoping is that we'll get very good ambition today and moving forward, and that those that level of ambition on those specific areas will start showing up informal things like the architecture for the, for the 2015 climate agreements. And that, that might seem a story that's a little hard to tell to your, <laughs> to your people, but that's, that's kind of the formal way that we're hoping it's going to work. No, I mean, it actually per perfectly makes sense. Uh, I mean, Dr. Warner, you mentioned also that, of course, there are several processes coming together. I mean, the climate change process is one big process. All of you, we talked about this, know the other process, the post-2015 uh, sort of agenda. I mean, uh, and just recently, of course, as all of us know, the Open Working Group has put forth it, 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 its report, which, which includes the 17 uh, proposed uh, uh, SDGs. And one among them, number 13, of course, is the one on climate change. It's, it's particularly vague. Uh, and it uh, very clearly, of course, also states that this process is led by uh, the whole UNFCC uh, process. So basically, what member states seem to agree is that climate change is very much part of the SDGs, 
Yet, uh, obviously, there's a holdback and people are waiting to see what exactly that process will, will, will bring about and what will come out of, uh, in the end, uh, the, the, the Paris COP, uh, which is, of course, in November, December next year. And just, just to add yes. one thing, Janos, the science really supports that if we don't find solutions for climate change, we will not be able to achieve our sustainable development goals. Finding solutions for climate change is essential for human welfare. And so today is one meeting in New York. We have so many leaders together here in New York, but it can't be stressed enough how important this is for what matters the most, which is human welfare. Thank you. And j just, just to pick up somebody who has been with the UN for the past 20 odd years, I think it is also important uh, for all of us to stress the fact, which, which you just mentioned, that these leaders, more than 120 leaders here, which is more than what we had in, in Copenhagen, we had about 94 there, we had 120 here. What is important uh, here, and this again was something that was stressed by Assistant Secretary General uh, Bob Orr in a leader press conference, is that one purpose of this gathering here, this high level meeting, is to introduce world leaders to climate change and introduce climate change to world leaders. We have always time and again stressed that when we talk about talk shops, even though this time it's not just about talk but it's about action, it's important to have these high level leaders here because many of them were not there in Copenhagen. So you have a new set of leaders for whom this is the first time that they're really talking at a high level with peers about climate change. And hopefully these leaders will most likely be still in office in about a year's time. So this is the critical mass on the political level that, that, that this summit is able to generate. So if nothing else, at least in a, in, a, in a year's time, you can always come and say, hey, you were there on the 23rd of September 2014. You made these pledges. Where are they now? And you hear um, some of the business leaders were talking about transparency, accountability, and tools like that. So again, the role of the media in this, in this debate is extremely crucial. Okay, so let us turn over now to, to, to you. Uh, please raise your hand and then we'll give the, give the floor and see who would like to take, uh, uh, take uh, the floor first and have questions to Dr. Warner. As I said, she has been to many of your, uh, your countries uh, and, and has extensive uh, uh, on-the-ground experience uh, as far as this issue. Okay, Bujumbura, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot. My name is Matthias Eragenja. I have a question. Uh, in fact, I was very pleased by uh, the speech of the Secretary General when he compared uh, the crisis in uh, Syria by starting his speech about this climate change. He said uh, he deplored first the loss of lives in that country. By me, if, if I try to make a parallel, a parallel analysis between uh, what is happening in Syria and these discussions about uh, climate change, I've been wondering if, for instance, in Syria, uh, developed countries, superpowers, if they have committed to help these people in Syria, if, for instance, uh, all those lost people would have been, uh, if the situation would have been as such. So if I come to the discussions underway, I wonder if these developed countries which go on developing industries are willing to stop or to shut to shut up to, to, to shut up the industry so that they avoid uh, 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 I mean uh, carbon emission otherwise people meet they talk they talk and afterwards it will be like uh, the countries of Copenhagen I I feel like pessimistic because I don't see any way out if Superpowers are not engaged really. Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. I think it goes back to the to the to, to the debate of of, uh, of uh, polluters, industrial countries, developed developing countries, which which is interesting because um, if I may just add my own little take on this, that in this summit so far I have not necessarily seen 
uh, this kind of a, a, a debate coming up. In fact, the Secretary General himself said that we need solutions that are not just for a few, but for all, and this whole issue affects everyone. Uh, having said this, I think the question is still very much a legitimate question, uh, that we might all be affected the same, we might all be affected, but maybe not the same way. We tend to say we're all in the same boat. But of course, it does make a difference whether you're rowing that boat, you have the water bottle next to you, or, uh, or you're just uh, there for, for a ride. Anyway, so, uh, the hardcore politics. Yeah, and it is very hardcore. Maybe two thoughts come to mind. African leadership immediately came to mind. What Mrs. Zuma was talking about, about the vision for Africa Clean Energy Corridor, that I found inspiring. Let's see how it develops over time, but what I took away from the work of these African countries is there's a need in Africa to ensure clean energy for development, not just for jobs, but also for the most important thing, human welfare. So what I saw that as an example of seeing an opportunity for things that need to be done urgently to, to secure development, to secure human welfare, and finding ways to do it that, that align human welfare and the need to, to fight climate change. And I thought that that is capturing an opportunity to transform our energy system. That seems, let's see again how it plays out. I think that your, your critical view is really important, but let's see, hopefully, that African leadership can provide an example. Another thing that comes to mind is a report that was released on the new economics of climate change. President, um, former Mexico President Felipe Calderon will be talking about that later this afternoon. And what they find in this report is that switching to renewable energies can offer at least as much economic growth and additional benefits to countries of the world as maintaining a basis in fossil fuels. I think you also heard from some of the colleagues in the oil and gas industry, although they uh, clearly have an interest in continuing to produce oil and gas and fossil fuels, that they also recognize the need to change the mix. And I think they also recognize that renewables have to be part of the mix, and that's a conversation that we have to have right now. Um, if, if I just may com come in and, and, and just sort of put something else in, the, in, 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 in this mix. I mean, when it comes to these political debates, obviously these are more on the level of the countries and the government. The other players who are all here on deck, so to speak, uh, the companies, the investors, the, the civil society and the academics, to me those are multinational. So uh, they're, they're not necessarily looking at things from a national point of view, but from, from something else. And that, to me, that might be something that may be able to bridge this, this political uh, debate or divide. Indeed, one of the, two of the initiatives that impressed me had to do a lot with setting incentives that governments may or may not respond to. For example, the financial sector, Mr. Met Anderson, was talking about pension funds, which are really the receptacle of the investment of, of huge parts of the world financial system, really encouraging the pension fund investors to invest in, in companies that are sustainable, that engage in clean energy, and things like that. So that seems to, to at least be going in a positive direction, setting incentives. Another initiative that I found pretty interesting was announced by David McLenna about commodity trading and sustainable supply chains. These kinds of things set incentives both at a high level for countries where decisions are made, you pointed that out so rightly, um, our colleagues in Africa, and they also get down right to the nitty gritty of the supply chain and how we do our business. Question from our colleagues in Dhaka, which we got, I think, through the chat function, and that's the following. Uh, what kinds of steps are you and member countries taking to reduce carbon emissions in acceptable percentage? So, what are the countries, members of the UN, 193 countries, uh, that 
you might be aware of that might be worth worth mentioning uh, in actually really reducing the uh, the. <laughs> So just to clarify, is the question about what the United Nations as no, a family is doing, or countries that are members? Countries, countries that are members. Yeah. Probably a lot. <laughs> One thing comes to mind. Okay. And there are there are probably so many examples. I live in Germany, and Germany has embarked on an energy transformation. And because I live in Germany, I hear about it every morning on the news. And I see the debates about government subsidies for this kind of industry or that, for this kind of energy or the other. But what I find very positive is a very serious political discussion has begun about transforming energy systems. And I think your question about an acceptable percentage, that's a tough one because it's acceptable we would need to be very high in our reduction of greenhouse gas emissions and no country in the world is anywhere close to that and that is that is i think a very serious reminder from the climate science of how far we need to take this debate but there are hopeful examples of different countries different regions moving into the region of 20 percent reduction um 30 percent reduction. Some countries are even more ambitious. Um, one of the things, of course, that come up is that that uh, these announcements are, are all wonderful and great, and we talked about it, uh, and quite bold and, and maybe even surprising. Uh, but of course, the question is, uh, how will they transform into actual reality? And one of the comments, questions that we have here uh, concerning Paraguay is, is exactly uh, on this, and it reads as follows. Uh, I was very happy to hear the commitment by Cargill representative. In Paraguay, they have acted completely opposite to the policies they announced today. They built a massive private port next to freshwater intels for the capital city, Asuncion, uh, against the recommendation of the National Water Company. What I'm saying is that some of these multinational companies are so powerful that they can completely override any local or national government. So that's kind of like a comment. We can even put a question mark there or an exclamation mark. Uh, uh, I am sure, Dr. Warner, that in your experience, you probably have other examples. So what could make us a little bit more optimistic mm -hmm. uh, that things might change? I think the, the remark is a really important one. Um, about the role of civil society and media and other partners in holding um, our governments, our companies, and other power players accountable for the commitments they make, and encouraging governments, companies, and other power players to be more ambitious. One of the principles of climate justice which Mary Robinson, the former right. Prime Minister of Ireland, some of you know, may know Mary's work. One of the central principles of climate justice is participation, accountability, and transparency in decision making. So I, I can't comment on the example that, you, that you've raised. I think it's really compelling, and we need more of local people having being empowered to hold companies, governments, other power players accountable for their commitment, pushing them to do more. Um, we have a... Okay, so let's give the floor to Bogota. Please, the floor is yours. Uh, good morning from Bogota, Colombia. Thank you very much for this very interesting session to make us complement and understand what's going on today in New York and around the world. We have two questions. One of you comes in to introduce myself, and then I will give the floor to a college in the university where he can pose the question himself. The first question is, uh, how important it is that we don't have a high level representative of China and India, which are more than half of the world population and, and one of the countries that are really uh, a problem for, for, for the, the, the climate change uh, situation that we're discussing. This is one question. Thank you for the Good morning. Uh, 
I would think that uh, some of the common citizens, uh, they care about the climate change, but they don't know exactly how to really uh, approach this important uh, issue. So what kind of things or what kind of tools we can use to really try to the people understand and uh, try to, if they can really do a specific activities to approach this problem. That would be all. I, I, we got the first question, which is, which is about the representation of China and India uh, or participation in, in the summit, or as you worded, the fact that they were not represented on a high level. Uh, what does that signal? What does that mean? That question we got. Uh, the second question we didn't quite get. It's something about what kind of tools are available for, but I, uh, I'm so sorry. No, I, I think, I think uh, I was thinking maybe as media, what, uh, how we can be effective in a really simple way to communicate the issues of climate change. Because some people really can understand really what it is about. So, yeah. uh, how tools maybe we can use to try to stay understanding that it is easier way, this important issue, so they can really afford them for the problem. I don't know if that's clear. Yeah, I think we understood. It's about how to how to make it clear to to people that this is an important issue. What can what can we do to make it, make them understand? Web, uh, Webex meeting. We had people from the World Meteorological Organization, including one of the climate presenters from South Africa, Paul. Uh, and of course, as as uh, as they have explained, they have this. They had a series from the start of September. They had a series of weather forecasts that would say how the weather would look according to, you know, based on what we know, and if we don't do anything, what kind of weather are we looking at, what the weather forecast would be if you would be doing that in 2050, and that's probably a fascinating thing. We have things from the chat function, I'm trying to read it as we go. Uh, let's see, don't you think it's a matter of discipline rather than politics? Uh, we can make huge institutions and organizations. Uh, do you think we can get success while what we call small people is not aware of the impact of climate change uh, in his or her life? This is, I think, what we discussed uh, now, right? Bringing it home to the, uh, to the person. What impact will Naomi Klein's new book, This Changes Everything, have on multinational corporations' participation in climate change does that ring a bell to you, Dr. Warner? Great. I'm ignorant. I don't know of this book, but please. <laughs> um, the work of Naomi Klein and many, many others across the world to raise awareness of climate change and to hopefully positively influence decision making, it's all going in the right direction. Positively trying to raise awareness and influence decisions in the right direction. I wish you well, and I don't know the the fate of this particular piece, but that's exactly what we need. We need more options for decision makers. We need more involvement, more transparency, more accountability, more participation by the people on the street at the ground level, because that's where climate change happens. OK, reading further on the, uh, from the, from the, from the chat. Is there any UN initiatives for the climate vulnerable countries like Bangladesh to mitigate the negative impact of climate change. So, concrete initiatives, maybe from the from through the UN, uh, that 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 actually help vulnerable countries. One could probably name many. Bangladesh itself um, is, in some ways, a showcase of a country that's very vulnerable to the effects of climate change, as well as a number of social and, and kind of environmental stressors. Um, one of the examples that I know of in Bangladesh is looking at livelihood resilience and how to help people with early warning systems, help them have sustainable, safe jobs and livelihoods in spite of growing climate stressors. I know that many of the regional organizations are active there. 
Um, so maybe we could just look at Bangladesh for some lessons learned about resilience, even in spite of um, this, these difficult challenges. It, it, it's interesting that you mention resilience because one of the of, of the key issues for this this summit, of course, is is about resilience. Uh, simply accepting the fact that we have we have basically done enough damage, so to speak. We have we have done. There's enough climate change done by us already uh, that we will not be able to turn that around, and we just have to have to live with it. Now, within resilience, uh, there are issues of uh, that, that that we heard uh, issues related to to insurance mitigation, etc. If I read your background well, I think you also have some expertise in that. Um, again, referring back to many developing countries in the world, the tool of insurance has been paired with other measures to reduce and transfer risk, um, sometimes with greater success, sometimes with less. Um, we've seen the use of microinsurance and microfinance in some places of the world, including um, BRAC, Amin Bank, there are lots of examples that are their home in Bangladesh that we're learning from of how to give people tools to adjust and protect themselves when the weather goes crazy. Turning to the chat function again, uh, is there any UN initiative climate, uh, that we had that? Um, as the climate change is the responsibility of human activities, what kind of activities people should stop as to prevent this situation uh, comparing to other creatures? Uh, in other words, I guess, yes, uh, what, what we humans can, can do. Again, it might go to the community level uh, experience that, uh, that Dr. Warner, you might have seen or you might know. What might be just simple things that you have seen that might make a big, big difference? Or even maybe the little things that the Secretary General himself uh, alluded to when he said that basically everybody you know, has, a, has a role to play. Yeah. Um, it's, my answer would be, we need change at every level. Huge, multi-country energy systems need to be transformed. But that might leave a community thinking, oh, that's too big for us, what do we do? There is so much that can be done by households and communities to make those households and communities more resilient if they face these, these climatic shocks, floods, droughts, storms, there are lots of things that we already experience today. Some of the things that can be done. Um, reducing emissions, uh, such as different kinds of cooking stoves, different uses of fuel. For example, a friend of mine is working with humanitarian organizations with a different type of cooking stove, so, like a pipe. Okay. It intensifies heat. It's not based on the use of wood, so it both reduces the kinds of emissions that aren't good for human health. It concentrates heat. It's built in a way that, that suits local co cooking conditions. There are lots of small things like that at the household level. Water preservation, water conservation. Um, we've heard of things like fog nets in, in Nairobi, uh, not Nairobi, I beg your pardon, in um, different places in Africa that collect condensation from the air. There are lots of different things that can be done to um, help in this fight against climate change. Okay. Both, and that's both on the energy side, and reducing greenhouse gas emissions, as well on, on the adaptation side that helps right. us get along in spite of climate change. I think we have something from, uh, let's see, uh, yeah. as a researcher, yes, as a researcher, how can you comfort or give again hope to people living in insular countries? We've had the opportunity to do field work in the Caribbean, in the Indian Ocean, in the Pacific. And you will hear many people ask questions just like this. For me, one of the particular areas of hope is the leadership that the Alliance of Small Island States provides in the, the, the international climate, climate negotiations, AOSIS, um, and other insular insular countries um, and states provide a lot of inspiration and aspiration. What I find really interesting is you see cooperation among insular countries with African countries, with Asian countries, 
And it is in the realm of international policy, but that's just one example of the very important role that these highly sensitive, highly climate vulnerable countries play in raising our sights and helping us achieve some solidarity in the fight against climate change. I think we will wrap it up. Uh, I have just one, actually a two-part question to, to, to close off. And one is that, yes, we have been stressing this. You stressed it. SG stressed it. All hands up on deck. The fact that everybody is here. Why was it so difficult up to now to get everybody here? All of these players. <laughs> you name the reason why is it so difficult? I think one of our one of our biggest challenges is that doing the right thing isn't the same as doing the convenient thing or the most expedient thing. And the challenge of climate change is that we really all need to bring what we have to the table. Um, but of course, we don't want to bring something to the table and have our neighbor not, not bring something to the table. So right. there, there are many reasons, but it's hopeful that so many countries and so many other leaders are here today in New York City to show they care about climate change, they take it seriously. We're always going to need more. It's a step in the right direction. Um, I think it's our job now to hold ourselves accountable and to keep moving very, ambitiously into the future. It's really in our hands. Okay, and what do you see is, is maybe the biggest challenge uh, up to uh, you know, getting that, that universal, global, binding, meaningful uh, agreement uh, uh, by, by the next, uh, or not the next, but by the Paris COP? In about a year, that's yeah. right. Um, there's a lot of analysis, but my sense is that our biggest challenge is to our our biggest challenge is to come with commitments to reduce global greenhouse gas emissions. Another challenge is finance. We need to find ways to put money on the table to make that transformation possible. Um, the third is that we also need to find ways to make people on the front lines of climate change, to give them a set of tools today that helps them continue to pursue human welfare in spite of the climate change that we all already have today. Those are the three big challenges. Find ways to reduce emissions, put money on the table, and other necessary resources, and help people at the front lines today. Excellent. Dr. Warner, thank you very much. It has been an honor and a pleasure and truly enjoyable uh, to have you here. Thank you very much for your insight. Wish you all the best. Uh, and hopefully, uh, in a little over a year's time, we will try to get you back uh, and, and uh, you can explain how you got the agreement and why it's great. So thank you very much. Good luck. Thank Thanks you and good luck to all of you. Thanks. Colleagues, please stay online because um, not only is this um, event unique in the sense of bringing everybody on board and having all the high level people here, etc., etc., but also unique from the perspective of the way we also try to cover it. <laughs> and not just with this live WebEx, but for example, with the very active social media uh, hub uh, or center that we actually have operating with our own social media team, the UN social media team, uh, and our very own uh, Rado from ICS is with Nancy Groves, who is the DPI, I can even say the UN Secretariat, social media focal point. So we'll try to patch uh, Nancy in and, and she can give us an idea of, of how things are developing on the social media front. Nancy, uh, are you there? Are, are you guys there? Can you hear me? Yes, absolutely. Okay, good. good. Nancy, good. give us an idea of what's going on down there. Well, um, we've set up a social media zone here on the third floor. So it's where, between where delegates are going back and forth from the General Assembly Hall and the um, plenary sessions in the other rooms. So we have a photo backdrop. We have some signs they can hold up in the six official languages. Um, and we're basically trying to pull people aside and get them to take a photo that we can share on social media. I just tweeted actually on the UN account, a, a photo gallery, so you can see some of the photos 
that we've taken already. Um, let's see, what else should I say? It's taken a lot of planning, though, intense planning. Um, you know, some of the things we learned, we should have water here for people. We need more seats. People actually are tired and exhausted and they want to sit and have a few moments of quiet. Um, also, people, I think this it's good since we've done this. Now people understand what it is and I think there'll be maybe less hesitation to come, come forward. So we were mainly doing high level um, officials. So the, let's see, like CEOs, we've had some CEOs come by, we've had some scientists come by, we've had um, celebrities, uh, some of the Google ambassadors, um, we're helping senior UN officials come by, so stay tuned as the day goes on, um, you'll see who else comes by. Um, I don't know if you want to take any questions, oh, we also have a social media wall on the second floor, which I think we tweeted a photo of too, which is being, we had an intern who was able to um, come up with a little program that dis displays both announcements from the event, so when um, countries or companies are making pledges or action items, they are able to, uh, it's tweeted right away on this, and it shows up on this wall, and then we're also showing, you know, world leaders who are stopping by the floor, um, stopping by to see, you know, what people around the world are saying as part of social media. So this is also exciting. Um, hopefully my, my wish is, now that people have seen this, that we can find something more permanent. A lot of this was paid for by the climate change support team, and not DPI. So um, hopefully we can find some way to make this sort of a more permanent um, way. But it's very staff intensive. We've had, we have like 12 hours of people sitting there looking through the tweets. Um, we've had to get volunteers from the peace and security section, from uh, peacekeeping, et cetera, to uh, also uh, come by and, and look through that. So um, I'd be happy to answer questions or um, even email questions afterwards. I think we've also volunteered to have a um, sort of maybe a, another open meeting where we debrief what we've done. Um, yeah. Uh, yes, uh, I think Nancy, that'd be that that'd be a good idea. Some uh, sometime later on to have uh, one of those open hour webexes with our unique colleagues uh, on, on on the lessons learned and on uh, on uh, the social media aspect. A quick question for me, though. Uh, being yeah. there, um, what, what what is your feeling? Uh, how how much do the people who are in uh, in, in this thing of, of, of climate change how I mean, how savvy are they? Uh, do, do, I mean, do they really use social media? Do they know uh, know a lot about it? Do they know what to follow, how to do things? I mean, what have what have you experienced? I think, so. uh, I think it's kind of all over the map. Some some people, uh, you know, actually today, I think people are not able to follow everything because they are uh, so busy taking part in the meetings today. And I noticed one person that came by said that he was going to sit down tomorrow and just get a big out of everything that happened. And they were asking us questions like, what did China say? What did this person say? And even I'm not able to stay on top of it because I'm actually trying to format the photos and do all these other things. So, um, but you know, I think uh, it, it really depends. I mean, some people are very savvy. Some people are very experienced with taking photos, etc. So. It's a big mix. It's a big mix. But it's helpful to have some examples down now so we can show them, like, oh, this is what somebody did first. And um, I think that's helpful, too. Yeah. Okay. And uh, just from your personal experience, anything anything that you found extremely interesting? Any tweets or, or any photos that you find, you know, really, really great or, or really unique or interesting? Um, but to you, yeah. I don't know. Visual is is good. I really like what World Food Program is doing because they're taking you know the hunger issue and uh, tying it in. Uh, but I honestly will have more to say about that I guess afterwards. Um, yeah. That's Okay. And anything on the on the languages? What you, what, what did you experience? Is it more more in English or 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 do you have? A, yeah. Yeah. We are doing um, on the wall itself. We have made a concerted effort to try to get all these official languages and different platforms. So it's not just Twitter. We have Weibo. We have Facebook, etc. Going on the wall. Um, 
know. It's, we'll have to look more. Actually, we're working with Twitter. They're also helping us analyze some of the tweets um, with some of the more sophisticated tools. And I asked them to look at the other languages because we do have hashtags in all six official languages and, and even more, I guess, in Portuguese um, and some of the other ones. So if they give us a useful report, it might be interesting to know. But I did notice like, the president of Mexico was tweeting and he's just using the English hashtag. So this is always a question that we have about how to do this for languages because also in the monitoring is six times harder when we're doing it in six other languages. Okay, great, great. Um, Nancy, listen, okay. thank you very much for, for oh, everything. Uh, we have passed on some of the basic information to our colleagues, so uh, everybody okay. will be able to follow and take part. Thank you very much. It's a busy day. No problem. Yeah. Uh, and wish you guys uh, all the best of luck, and thanks for giving us a bit of your time. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye. Ciao. Bye. Bye. Okay, uh, I think the bulk of, of what we wanted to cover uh, is, is, is basically uh, done. Uh, we were ho hoping to also get one of the Dan's uh, up here, but uh, I don't see them, see them coming. Um, so, to be quite honest with you, uh, I think we could probably uh, wrap it up uh, where we are now. I honestly think that after the the very sort of focused, clear uh, press conference that we had from the Secretary General and uh, his invited guests, plus the analysis we got from Dr. Warner, uh, I don't think we can add anything more to it. Uh, everything else is happening as we're talking, uh, meaning that there is that uh, uh, private sector forum lunch that also the Secretary General himself, I think, uh, mentioned and some of the colleagues there are going. Uh, and then in the afternoon, of course, uh, as, as AESG Bob or mentioned, there will be sort of other multilateral announcements and, and, and coalition actions uh, as far as the thematic areas are concerned and as far as the sort of uh, uh, focus areas are concerned. And obviously the big issue will be uh, the very end, uh, which is going to be in the General Assembly Hall, which is the closing ceremony. Now if anybody is wondering what is supposed to be the outcome of all of this, uh, apart from the whole list of sort of uh, commitments, then all of this will be captured in what is called a chairman's summary. In other words, it will be a document which will be issued by the Secretary General himself, and it will be a summary that summarizes uh, the various commitments uh, and outcomes. Uh, and obviously, as we have been discussing and hoping that all of that will fold into the negotiations process directly or indirectly, but will be part of uh, the COP process, uh, starting, of course, with Lima, Peru, uh, 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 in, I think, November, December this year, and then, of course, next year, uh, culminating in Paris, uh, end of November, beginning of uh, be, be, beginning of, uh, of December, and parallelly, of course, you will have the post-2015 process also culminating, and the two of them are, of course, very much intertwined. So with that, I would like to wish you the best of luck. Thank you very much for being part of this experiment. Uh, we certainly liked it. Uh, I'll be honest with you, I enjoyed it. Uh, and uh, I think we, had, we were lucky, we had good guests. Uh, I hope that uh, you also found it uh, both entertaining and also informative. Uh, whatever um, insights, lessons learned you have, whatever advice, whatever thoughts you might have as regards future such um, uh, things that we might do in this, in this vein would be more, uh, more than, uh, than welcome. So with that, I wish you all the best. Good afternoon, good evening, uh, uh, maybe good morning to some. Uh, but uh, a, a, a heartfelt thanks to all of you. Thanks to my colleagues here at ICS. Of course, uh, Rado, who is just coming in. Uh, Judy and Gosia and Luke, uh, all of us from here, we wish you the very best. Please continue to, uh, to look into uh, what is happening, how things will uh, culminate. Uh, we'll continue to send uh, whatever materials we get. And of course, as of tomorrow, 
uh, the so-called Big Week starts here at 9 o'clock uh, in the morning uh, with, of course, Brazil speaking first traditionally, as has been the case in all general assembly, general debates, kicking that off uh, as a result of a historical commitment that Brazil made in the very first general assembly. So with that, Obviously, uh, we will have uh, our eyes and attentions continue to be on the General Assembly, on the member state representatives, on high level political commitments and political will expressed in a variety of different issues. Uh, and the fact that today, for one full day, over 120 countries at the highest possible level focused on climate change in a very concrete way at a time when we have other major international challenges where the world is in turmoil in many places, I think in itself signifies the importance that this issue is now occupying in the minds of decision makers. So thank you once again for, for, for being part of this. Wish you all the best and we will see each other very soon in, in another one of our WebExes. Uh, good uh, night, good afternoon, thanks a lot, good luck to all of you. It has been great to see you, thanks, bye. Thank you, bye.